Good afternoon, it's Wednesday the 7th of December 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Mike Robinson. Um, we will be joined very shortly by Alex Thompson uh, with Eastern Approaches. And of course, Alex will be speaking from uh, Holland. Uh, well, the weather across the country is uh, pretty mixed. Um, Norfolk seems to be doing OK with sunshine. Uh, same for Rill. Plymouth's a bit grey north of the border. Glasgow and uh, central Scotland, I think, is um, dull, wet and um, grey, apparently. OK. So there we are. Um, well, here's a bit more grey than the investigatory powers act. Now, we've been talking about this uh, over the last number of weeks with Alex Thompson uh, on the program. Uh, and uh, this article, I strongly recommend everybody goes and reads. It's in the register. It's called, uh, the headline is, The UK's Investigatory Powers Act Allows the State to Tell Lies in Court. Uh, and their subheading is Enshrining Parallel Construction in English Law. And this uh, is a pretty important article. Uh, it highlights some of the things that we've been highlighting over the last few weeks. But uh, this one had passed us by because they're focusing on uh, uh, Section 56 of the Act uh, which they say that as passed sets out a number of matters that are now prohibited from being brought up in court. Uh, and they describe Section 56, they, uh, they quote the, the section of the Act, uh, and then they say that uh, uh, Section 56 1b creates a legally guaranteed ability, nay duty, to lie about even the potential for state hacking to take place uh, and to tell juries a wholly fictitious story about the true origins of material used against defendants in order to secure c criminal convictions. This is incredibly dangerous, they say. Moreover, in Section 56.4, sorry, as Section 56.4 makes clear, this applies retroactively, ensuring that it is very difficult for criminal offences committed by GCHQ employees and contractors over the years using powers that, they were, that, that were only made legal a fortnight ago to be brought to light in, in a meaningful way. So, um, Alex, uh, I'm going to bring you straight in because this is uh, an un unbelievably dangerous situation where uh, Crown employees go into a court of law where they're supposed to tell the truth, the whole truth, the truth and nothing but the truth. Uh, and they're not only being enabled to lie, uh, they're in fact being encouraged, or if not even uh, required to lie under oath uh, in front of a jury. Where does this leave justice? It leaves uh, English statute law at odds with natural justice. And that's the key point to bear in mind. Uh, this is an unlawful statute and it's incumbent upon the first jury that has the good sense to, to see what it is, to strike it out through jury nullification. And with that in mind, if you are any Crown employee, any public servant, because I'm looking at the section on the screen here, and it says that uh, in, in subsection three that it applies to any person holding office under the Crown, anyone employed by a police force or a postal operator, or even by the wording of it, contractors for any of those. So if you're anyone, in court and you are challenged and you're told this section of the new act applies to you, what you need to say is, I appeal to the jury to nullify this statute because it is contrary to natural justice. I know where this has come from, Mike, because uh, when I was still a GCHQ officer, we had briefing at unclassified level, of course, because there's nothing classified in it, by the legal advisor, a slightly prickly but fair man, uh, who gave a talk on the title, What Happens where our, When Our Intelligence Comes to Court? And this, of course, was a decade ago. There was none of this then. And he said with a sheepish look on his face, well, actually, we can't stop a judge ignoring a classification. If the other side's got it or subpoenaed it and it ends up in court, you, GCHQ officers, are going to have to be honest about it. And this is an attempt to plug that retroactively. It's unlawful and illegal, even if it's in the statute book. And looking at subsection two, what it says that you cannot say, and this is not just intelligence officers, this is anyone in public office, you cannot say uh, when cross-questioned, uh, yes, we, got, we asked foreign government X to get this information. You cannot say, yes, we applied to the Secretary of State for a warrant against this person, or yes, we forced this person to become an informer for, for the person in the dock. Uh, you can't say any of that stuff according to this law. So that is an unlawful statute. Um, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's just another example of how constitutionally Britain is being left high and dry. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, this... I suppose is related to, to everything that's going on around Brexit as well. Um, this attitude of uh, undermining uh, our common law constitution and the protections that it provides uh, and overriding those with, with unlawful statute. 
Yes, it's enshrining principles. You see, that was the subheading of the Register's article again, and they're not endorsing that, they're just reporting on it. And this is the dangerous language here. The idea of enshrining is pretending that something is law which never was law. And English common law is unchangeable and unbreakable. Uh, so you, you, you can't have that. It's uh, an attempt to uh, to get away with it. You know, it's, it's uh, bringing in an 11th commandment, thou shalt not get away with it, and pretending that it's equal to the others. But anyone who is a serving intelligence officer watching this, or uh, anyone else uh, who feels they may be affected in court, just bear in mind what the legal advisors said in the intelligence agencies in my day. They wouldn't say it now, I don't think, which is that you don't have any protection. If the judge and the jury act lawfully, your office will not protect you from lying. Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting statement. It's very interesting. I, I listened to this um, discussion uh, this afternoon and uh, my mind goes back to the Cold War period when uh, supposedly things were so simple. We were the good guys and we looked across the wall and what did we have? We had uh, the police turning up in the middle of the night to take people away. We had secret courts. Um, we had uh, politicisation of the courts. And this, of course, was all the tactics of those nasty communists, the other side of the wall. Uh, what are we watching being put together? Exactly the same system. But of course, here it is much more dangerous because it's being done under the veneer of um, squeaky clean men and women in their fine suits and clothes. So this is very dangerous, I think. Just before I, I go back to Alex, um, just one, one other quote from this article, that they are calling this the establishment of a parallel system of secret justice. And this is something we've been talking about for quite a long time. And in fact, uh, full fact, the uh, fact-checking organization has criticized us directly in the past for alleging a parallel system of secret justice, but it's absolutely it's coming out in the open. Yeah. Alex. Just to say, without taking up too much more time, um, this is a necessary precursor to an East German style system because the Stasi, the Staatssicherheitsdienst, the uh, secret service there, had its offizielle Mitarbeiter, its official employees who could go, in, go into court and say, take my word for it, I'm a state employee. But it also had people who were forbidden from appearing in court and up to a fifth or a quarter of the population. And they were the EM, the inoffizielle Mitarbeiter, the unofficial uh, snipes, basically. And they were there to, to, to clipe, to use that good Scots word, on, on all the rest of the population. So that is uh, what this is being set up for. Uh, and you can see that there's going to be weasel words about the difference between a court and a tribunal. That's the core of what Mike was just saying about parallel justice. They can get away with it and still and already do to some extent in the US by saying uh, that there is a fictitious distinction between a court where a court of law rules apply and a court of record and a tribunal. Or in America, they, they, they say that they, these exist under different titles of law. And at anything that's called a tribunal, it's the rules of equity and uh, jurisprudence and even the state, which is running it, not the judiciary. So don't be sucked in by this. Uh, good advice. Okay. Very good advice. Uh, well, if we've just heard, if you like, the documentary uh, evidence as to what's happening in the uh, justice system, if we can call it that, let's have a look at practicalities. So we'll um, bring in Melanie Shaw. And uh, just to say that we've been able to um, uh, hear a recorded uh, phone conversation with, Ellen, with uh, Melanie. This has been heavily redacted, um, but let's just remember this lady has now been in prison for over seven and a half months. During that time, she's been kept in solitary confinement, so only out of her cell for half an hour a day for a shower, no interaction with other prisoners no access to the long-term medication which she's needed to, to survive since she was a child abuse victim in Beechwood uh, Children's Home, Not Nottingham, under immense pressure, lied to by the prison staff, visitors blocked, mail blocked. Let's just listen to uh, a few of the uh, things that the lady was able to talk about. Hello, darling, it's Melanie. Let me to use the phone. Um... Right, I need to tell you something important. I've signed a disclosure, uh, a printout one came out there from Nottingham City Home. They're destroying my £25,000 contents on the 16th of now. All the things that have happened to me in this prison, right, I've now got staff on the fame game train wanting to make a name for themselves out of me, right? Now, when they were alleging all this, I mean, don't forget, I was kicked in the head when I swallowed toxic substances. Well, what I'd like to say is, I wasn't unwell when I came to prison. 
and it seems like it's just one excuse after another to now try and control me. It is a witch hunt on. Let, let's talk seriously, witch hunt. And I'm, I, I don't understand what this government is so frightened about because I will be released from the bail address for a week until City Homes rehouse me. Because what the, what the planning to... They're planning on remanding me as soon as I get out, putting me back in prison because they want to know where I'm living and I'm technically homeless. My cat, I don't know whether they've destroyed my pet cat for 14 years. Where's Phoebe gone? You know? I don't want her locked in at prison, a PDSA, because they're done with my cat. Because I'm in, I'm in isolation in this prison, which is absolutely disgusting. They keep lying and saying, we'll sort you out association because Christmas is coming up. You've got all these child sex offenders and murderers in here. One's gone out on a day trip in a taxi. We, ask, I'm getting all my mail now, I think. I mean, I don't know. And I've got absolute tons of mail. I've got over 3,000 letters in them three months in prison for the arson I didn't do. I've had nothing near that this time. But I have had a Christmas card coming from John Champ, was in ever. But could, could you ask Brian to put it on the column, please? To a shout out for Christmas cards for me. That's all I've got to look forward to. You know, I'm not bothered if people send me money or not because the prison will probably steal it from me or find me for something and take it. I'm not allowed to spend, I'm not allowed to search. I was just 20, this lockdown on me, you know, I'm, I'm in. 24 hours in a cage, like a Romanian circus bear. But thank God for everything he's doing for me and the public. I love him. And I felt and the prayers that are coming through. Well, if that doesn't affect our uh, viewers and listeners today, I don't know what, uh, what would. This is the reality of Theresa May, David Cameron's uh, conservative Britain. There is no justice. Child abuse, whistleblowers, far from being helped and supported locked up in solitary confinement for over seven and a half months. That is the definition of torture under the United Nations rules, at least. And that is the so-called justice meted out to child abuse victims in UK. So Melanie's still unsure of what she's actually been charged with. She's apparently due to be sentenced in January next year. Um, but she's also said that uh, she believes she's going to be charged with a whole range of other things which have been supposedly happening in prison. And remember, of course, the medication that this lady has needed to survive um, over, the, uh, 20, over some 25 years since her original abuse took place, that medication denied to her once again. So Melanie said many other things. We can't, we can't share those with the public for a variety of reasons. So that little audio heavily edited, but I think it gets out an impression of what's happening. Now, let's have a look at what the state says about things. And we'll just recap on this letter, which uh, came from Bob Neal, who's chairman of the so-called Justice Committee. Uh, in the second paragraph uh, there, he was talking about Melanie. Uh, yes, somebody has asked uh, the committee for help, uh, but uh, he can't do anything because he's not permitted to intervene in individual cases and the committee isn't either. So basically, it doesn't matter what the crime is, it's no concern of the Justice Committee. Uh, well, yesterday I had a chance to speak to the clerk of the Justice Committee. Now, this is five minutes long. It's a little telephone call. I'd encourage people to stick with it. Listen to what this man says to me. Uh, bearing in mind, here is an advert from the uh, Justice uh, part of the government's website, which says, watch our bite-sized guide on how committees in the House of Commons gather evidence and how you can get involved. Let's hear what he had to say. Hello. Hi, Mr. Gerrish. Yes. My name's Nick Walker. I'm clerk of the Commons Justice Committee. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming back to me. Um, I, I um, work with a group of mainly volunteers, and we produce yeah. a, a, a news programme. Yeah. Uh, we cover a lot of stuff to do with abused children, which is of yeah. immense public interest. Yeah. And a member of the public has sent in a letter that he's received from the chairman, Bob Neal. Yes. I think the first paragraph is probably to do with Keith Lairs, but we'll leave that aside. The second paragraph is the, is the one that's important for me. And that, right. That is, he, he, this is what Mr Neal says. 
You ask me to use my powers to end what you describe as the victimisation. You've seen the original letter that Mr Brown sent to Mr Neil, I take it. I've got it in front of me. Yeah. The letter that Mr Brown sent to Mr Neil. Um, no, I haven't got a copy of that. I've only got the response. You need to, you need to get a copy of that from Mr Brown, I, I, I suggest, but go on. Um, Right, he says, um, you asked me to use my powers to end what you describe as the victimisation of child abuse whistleblowers and to support the release of Melanie Shaw from prison. I'm afraid the Justice Committee is not committed to indiv in individual cases, so neither I nor the committee have any powers which we could exercise in relation to her case. This is a matter for the legal process. It is also a matter on which her constituency MP may be able to assist her. Mm. Um, well, that, that paragraph um, leaves the public in complete no man's land because the whole reason that, that there's public interest in this case is because of the total breakdown of, of justice procedures which we could take into the courts but we could also take into the way that this woman has been treated in prison. So, so to say that the Justice Committee can't intervene. It's not a question of intervening, it's a question of the Justice Committee paying attention to what's going on here because the government needs to be held to account. There's nothing I can really add to Mr Neil's comments. If you want to write, write to Mr Neil about this or get Mr Brown to write to him, then he'll respond again. But there's nothing I can say in, in addition, I'm afraid. So, so, so I, I can report to the public that the Justice Committee simply does not care if there is a breakdown of the very justice procedures which they're supposed to be scrutinising. Um, you can report that the Justice Committee is not able to look at individual cases. They don't need to look at the case. They don't need to look at the judicial aspects of the case. They, they can there's, look there's at... No, there's nothing I can add, Mr Garrett. If you want to continue the discussion with Ms Neil, write to him. Um, well, well... <laughs> My pause says it all, as, as a man who I think is reasonably well informed about how certain things work in the country. This letter from the chairman is a statement that the, the Justice Committee... Cannot said, intervene in the no, 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 it's not that. That's what it says. No, no, it's the Justice Committee is not interested. No, it doesn't say that. It says the committee cannot intervene in individual cases. Do you, do you know anything... It says that quite clearly. Do you know anything about any of the child abuse cases at the moment. The committee does not look at individual cases. I can't add anything to so, Mr Neil's letter. Just explain to me, in simple layman's terms then, what the committee does. Um, the committee looks at the administration, expenditure and policy of the Ministry of Justice. It does not intervene in legal cases. Policy of justice. Policy, administration and right. expenditure of the Ministry of Justice. Would you consider that somebody should be brought in front of a... a uh, Mr Gerrish, I'm not getting into an argument with you about policy I'm not issues with like you. this. I'm you are. Pardon? You are. I'm clarifying. You're, you're asking me to enter into, into a discussion about policy issues, which I can't as a member of committee staff. Wait, if you want to pursue the issue, write again me. to Mr Neil. Excuse me. If you want to pursue the issue, write again to Mr Neil. Excuse me. You, you have just said to me that the committee deals with policy. You are the secretary, are you not? Of the Ministry of Justice. You are the secretary of the Ministry of Justice. No, I'm the clerk of the Justice Committee. Right, okay, you're the clerk of the Justice Committee. Therefore, part of your specific role will be to understand the policy with which the committee deals. Is that not the case? Mr Brown asked the committee to look into the case of Melanie Evans. The chair, in his reply, explained that the committee can't yes, do but that. I, I, that I'm not talking about her individual case. If you want to talk about something else, then write to the chair of the committee I about just, it. I've just asked you a simple question, which is, can you explain to me whether an individual, doesn't have to be a named individual, but is the policy in this country that an individual should be brought in front of a court of law? I'm not commenting on the case of Melanie Evans. I don't know about it. All I'm telling you is the committee doesn't look at individual cases. It is the policy. <laughs> Does I'm going to put the phone down now. We're not getting anywhere. If you want to follow this up, follow That's it up in writing, rude. please. That's very rude.
there we have it. This is, um, this is Theresa May's conservative British government, which simply does not care one fig for justice or the public. And you can hear how unbelievably arrogant and rude to the clerk to the Justice uh, Committee is. Uh, he couldn't tell me about policy because I think he doesn't know because nobody really understands how law's breaking down. Uh, but the, I mean, my observation here is it demonstrates very clearly how everything is so closely partitioned. There's, you know, an MP can't deal with uh, an issue from another constituency because of parliamentary protocols. Uh, at, at, you know, what is this? This is a select committee which is supposed to investigate the operation of Parliament. So, so one of those, uh, uh, one of the functions of Parliament is for M MPs to represent their uh, constituents, and in this case, Melanie is absolutely being let down by her MP uh, and by Parliament as a whole. But they don't want to investigate that because their terms of reference are so narrow that they claim they can't. Well, it's, it's even worse than that, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm sure Alex will want to come in. Let me just uh, do this very quickly. So. Bearing in mind what you've just heard that gentleman say, uh, let's come back to the Justice Committee. Here it is, um, and this is the page for the role of the Justice Committee. It was appointed by the House of Commons to examine the expenditure, administration and policy of the Ministry of Justice and associated public bodies to include the work of staff provided for the administrative work of FUTs, excluding consideration of individual cases and appointments. So this is what he was getting at, that they don't look at individual cases. Well, have a look at this, because here is the committee, and this is Mr. Bob Neal, the chairman at work, on prison reform, the greatest overhaul of prisons in a generation. This was end of uh, November, and he was interviewing these two um, gentlemen, Sam Guillermo, if I pronounce that pro properly, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for Prisons and Probation, and Michael Spur. Uh, the chief executive of um, National Offender Management Service. So he's taking evidence from these people, but he doesn't want to take any evidence when you try and say, well, actually, these people are telling lies and the true situation is, is not coming out. So, um, Alex, just give you a, a quick response to that. Absolutely tragic what they are doing to Melanie because, of course, she was highly vulnerable before she went in prison. She is clearly being mentally stretched, how she's held it together, I don't know. And now we're faced with this aggressive, um, self-righteous, arrogant approach from uh, Westminster representatives of the respective political parties. This is breakdown of law and order in UK. Brian, you made that clerk of the committee deeply uncomfortable, and you said yourself, my pause says it all, but then he had to pause and do a sharp intake of breath when you asked him what his job was. The tragedy is that, as you've shown the terms of reference there, he is technically not lying in all that arrogant bl uh, bluster, because the committee was set up with terms of reference preventing it from looking at individual cases. Well, even the word case is a legal definition. Uh, and there is, as you said, the judicial aspect of a case versus how a person's been treated. And if you don't uh, take the wider definition of the case, um, you know, how a person's been treated, have they been given their, their, their due treatment under law and due process, then how on earth can the committee fulfill its terms of reference, which is to look at administration and policy? How can you do that without looking at individual cases? Well, as regards Melanie, go on. Well, it's exactly that, Alex, isn't it? It's so clever. You say, well, where's the evidence? Well, the evidence the system isn't working is held in individual cases. Individuals have experienced problems with the establishment. Their evidence is the evidence which needs to be brought forward so that uh, failures of government and, and the organisation, judicial organisation, can be dealt with. But no, 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 we don't want to see real evidence. We, we want the boss of the prison service to tell us how wonderful his prisons are. Uh, th you know, this is straight out of East Germany. I know there are a few people who say we're Germans and we're nice people. I'm very happy with that. I'm just making a point that we, we knew during the, the darkest days of the East German regime that this is exactly how the political um, judiciary and police system worked. It was all lies. And we are just seeing the same thing introduced by um, Blair Cameron and uh, Theresa May. 
Absolutely, Brian. I was just before you mentioned the GDR, I was going to say that this reminded me of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, where he describes Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt, the then first lady, swanning about doing her uh, grand dame of human rights thing in Soviet prisons just after the war. And whenever she was asked about conditions, she would say, of course, I can't comment on individual cases, but the policy is being well administered. So that's exactly what's going on here. Later, we discovered that she was a communist fellow traveller. Uh, before I forget about Melanie, it's exactly two years ago this month that I started uh, calling her. And with my dialectological experience, I would have to say, although I wouldn't claim professional expertise, but pretty good expertise for my old job, um, she's reverted through shock and or drugs and sedatives. I can't, don't know which. She's reverted to her childhood accent. She's a lot more pronounced East Midlands accent than when I spoke to her two years ago, and also 30% slower. Uh, you heard the nasalization of some of the uh, comments she's made. Uh, I think that either it's a chemical kosh or, or a literal kosh has been uh, applied to her in prison. Otherwise, she wouldn't be speaking that slow and, and that much in her childhood accent. Uh, well, we in fact have more evidence of what's actually happened to her, but I, I'm not able to share that at the moment for a, a variety of reasons. Let's move on. Yes, OK. Uh, well, we'll move on to Syria and uh, let's look at 21st century war here. Breaking news from last night that Aleppo's old city, now fully liberated by uh, the Syrian army, remaining terrorists in retreat. Uh, and this was uh, information from Vanessa Bailey, who's in Damascus at the moment. Uh, she's waiting to head to Aleppo uh, and I believe she's going to do that at the weekend. Hopefully we'll have her on this program for a short time on Friday. Uh, and uh, well, the message from uh, Vanessa was, since I arrived in Damascus on Monday, the 5th of December, there's been a simmering excitement from all members of society, a sense of impending victory in Aleppo. That anticipation seems to have been satiated tonight uh, as news is coming that the Syrian Arab army is pushing home its advantage and sweeping clean the remaining pockets of terrorist resistance against the SAA advances, uh, supported by their allies from Iran, Russia, and Hezbollah. Uh, I met with Mother Agnes Mariam, uh, today in Damascus City Centre to discuss her work supporting uh, the Syrian state's reconciliation projects, which offer all manner of amnesty and rehabilitation for armed mercenaries. Uh, during the meter meeting, Mother Agnes made the statement that between Syrians, there are only solutions, no conflict. The conflict comes from outside Syria. So that, uh, that says it all. Uh, in the meantime, um, as we suggested yesterday, the day before, things moving out of Aleppo uh, and uh, the attack heading towards uh, ISIS pockets in Deir Zor and Idlib. Uh, and so uh, hopefully it will not be too long, uh, Brian, until uh, Syria is free of, uh, of these external forces calling themselves ISIS. Uh, it's fascinating to watch, Mike, and I think uh, we can predict that we're going to see a huge increase in the rhetoric from uh, particularly the BBC, of course, that um, uh, we'll move on to another location. It'll be Ukraine. We'll start to see a shift now of, of uh, UK, US, NATO policy to uh, yeah, accuse we're, we're coming on to that, accuse Russians so. of other areas. Yeah. Yes. Uh, right. Now, uh, the other day, Brian, you were talking about Europol and the, uh, well, comments from the Europol head about um, how we were going to see dangerous uh, people moving into Europe if uh, the situation in Syria ends up going the way it looks like it's going to go. And Alex, you wanted to highlight uh, this article from The Independent. Turkey poised to send 3,000 refugees to Greece every day, according to intelligence officials. Um, do you think that the, the comments from the head of Europol are related to this? Was, was it more of a threat than a warning? I think we have to put two and two together there, Mike, because it's not uh, current people sitting in Turkey that we're being warned about. We're being warned uh, you know, in a veiled way about the fact that once Aleppo and the rest of Syria has been fully uh, liberated of, of terrorist zones, these guys are going to sluice their way into Turkey and they are then going to be at the rate of 3,000 a day put on boats. The still you showed there is Erdogan's party people and him saying, he's yelling by the way, which Turkish leaders sometimes do to make a point. Uh, he's saying, I will open the floodgates and Europe will have hell to pay. Uh, just like Gaddafi used to, by the way. Um, and you can see at the end of that clip, if you go to it, that they all stand up and give him an ovation. So he means it. OK, and uh, well, we'll just move on through this. So um, you wanted to highlight uh, this from Newsbud, uh, the disastrous track record of the new leader of the free world. Yes, this is Christoph German, who writes for Newsbud, which is Sibel Edmonds' uh, outfit, which he's um, set up recently. 
uh, it's a bit bigger than her now. And Christoph German has, he's obviously a German as well as having the name German, but he's a particular Eastern Europe specialist. I've been in touch with him, actually. I put this in first just to show people that Germany is losing its economic supremacy. We keep hearing in, uh, in the wake of Brexit and Trump that Germany is the last sane economy and it's going to be the last man standing. Uh, look at Germany. It's a powder keg. Uh, and this is, uh, German's article is that inequality is actually going towards Anglo-Saxon levels and that actually Merkel is serving a US agenda, not, not a German agenda in her aggression towards Russia. And she's cut herself, cut her own hand off really, or cut off her nose to spite her face because a lot of German businesses are no longer able to export to Russia and Eastern Europe as a result of the sanctions. Um, well, you're going to have to talk about this one. Yes, um, this is a tragic story. They all are, but this one has achieved notoriety. Um, this is a 19-year-old young lady who was raped and murdered uh, by a 17-year-old Afghan who wasn't screened or vetted because of the mass migration. Uh, I don't know whether you put the quote in, but essentially the German head of the police federation said uh, to Bild Zeitung, the German equivalent of the sum, well, you inevitably get this if, if mass migration is done too quickly and no background checks are done. And all we have is an arrogant political cl class that insists the most precious thing is their own, uh, the sanctity of their own moral judgments. Uh, and they, they will not accept that they've made a mistake. This has caused a huge fuss because she happens to be the daughter, uh, the late daughter now, of Herr Dr. Clemens Ladenburger, who is the number two at the European Commission's Directorate General of Legal Services. So he's the second most senior Mandarin in the most important DG of the whole of the European Union, uh, which uh, you remember the book I re recommended last week. Uh, that Dutch Mandarin makes a point of the fact that legal services are the core of the European Commission. And here is Landenburg, and he's lost his own daughter as a result of this policy. Okay, and uh, uh, the Guardian here is saying that uh, UK Muslims uh, show a worrying belief in conspiracy theories, according to a think tank. Uh, we'll just bring up one little quote from this. They're saying, however, it also found that 31% of UK Muslims believe the US government was behind the 9-11 terror attacks, with a further 7% blaming the Jews, uh, and only 4% saying Al-Qaeda was responsible. You know, um, if you looked at anti-Semitism in British society, you'd find that probably a lot more than 7%. Uh, Muslims are actually better informed and uh, in some cases, don't laugh, but they, 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 some, some viewers might laugh, but Muslims, if you talk to them in Britain, are more aware of Jewish history and more pro-Jewish than, than the background population. And uh, the Muslim Council of Britain speaks for nobody, but it's particularly the, the policy exchange, this think tank, as they call themselves, which uh, was interesting here. Because the, the, the um, I was going to say Groniad, the Guardian, um, likes to quote them uncritically. But even they have to admit that actually uh, by far the biggest conspiracy theory that British Muslims hold is just like the rest of us, that the US government did 9-11 as an inside job. There's far more Muslims in Britain who think that than think that the Jews or Al-Qaeda had anything to do with it. Um, and uh, David Goodhart was behind this, uh, this survey, I suppose. Yes. And uh, what's his background? Demos. Right. And who funds his, his current lot? The Open Society Foundation. Um, so no, no surprises there then? None at all. And thanks to the viewer who pointed out this, uh, this link to us. But then we have something interesting from, uh, from Breitbart, which I think is our no, next no, Hold slide. on. The next one is, is uh, how transparent are think tanks. And, and uh, yeah. you wanted to highlight this table on the right-hand side, which um, seems to, it's, it's uh, grading think tanks, green, amber, and red. Uh, and of various shades, and really policy exchange gets the worst uh, sort of status of any of the think tanks uh, that, that are on that list. Well, this, this is a bunch of people. Interestingly, the author is in Tbilisi, Georgia, uh, where I used to live, and he is now shining the light back on Europe from the, the what we could call the new free world in Eastern Europe and saying, actually, Europe and America are infested with lobbyists masquerading as think tanks, which he says at the front of this report. And here he ranked, or his organisation ranks, uh, British uh, so-called think tanks, self-proclaimed ones, for what they disclose about their funding. And as you mentioned, the Adam Smith Institute and three others, basically neocon outfits down the bottom, are in the bottom category. And it's not just them. There's a website called Who Funds You? And they've given the policy exchange a D on a scale of A to E for their transparency of funding. So something is clearly here that they're one of the four British so-called think tanks that don't think the public has any right to know who gives them money. Um, and this is the Breitbart article that you wanted to highlight. And, and this is something that we've been um, suggesting for quite some time, that the um, anti-extremism legislation in the UK would be casting a net a lot wider than just the Muslim community. And the headline here says Muslims account for only a third of the referrals to the government's de-radicalization program. 
This is astonishing because uh, I spent eight years at GCHQ seeing the rise of the prevent strategy. And it was all about Muslims, 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 Muslims. And my old roommate went actually and did some consultancy for some years, helping uh, a British county with a large Muslim population uh, develop its school's anti-radicalization agenda and became very jaded about it. And he sent this to me when it came out in the spring from Breitbart and said, only a third. Well, who are the other two thirds of reports then? Uh, it seems that we have a bit of a clue from the story from, I think, Hampshire earlier this year, when young people went to the UKIP website and were tracked and reported to the um, extremism authorities. I think that's what the prevent strategy is, is actually being more used for. And it shows that there is not a serious threat uh, with Muslims any more than there is with the rest of us. And as for the, what The Guardian reported uh, from the policy exchange about Muslims being problematic, they didn't use that word, but saying problematic because they um, they are less integrated and live separate lives. Well, if you go to any of the uh, Yorkshire and Lancashire towns where Muslims cluster or Luton, well, obviously they want to stay away from uh, the crime of the white population and the um, the pimping of the Kosovar gangs and whatever else there is in their neighbourhoods. They want to live cleaner lives than that. So it's no surprising they keep to themselves. Mm. OK, well, I'd... sorry, but you... no, you've got another one to come. I'll just bring in this, this one, uh, which is the Daily Mail. Um, what are they talking about? We've got an Iraqi asylum sister, uh, uh, sorry, Iraqi asylum seeker arrested for sexually assaulting students in Germany. And I just wanted to make the point that here was the male uh, picking up on event in Germany, and they're making a very big story out of it. It's a very unpleasant story, but here it is. They want to talk about it. Uh, but of course, the same Daily Mail can't report on who it was that abused. Melanie Shaw and the other children, the Daily Mail can't report on the Doherty family. So when we come to the uh, to rapes, abuse, trafficking, vile stuff going on in UK, all of a sudden our mainstream uh, newspapers and TV stations just seem unable to do any investigative journalism at all. And of course, the answer for this is that it's uh, uh, this is the source of the blackmail for these despicable political party representatives who are calling themselves uh, members of parliament. Um, OK, so uh, obviously the NATO, we mentioned this on Monday, the NATO foreign, uh, foreign ministers meeting is going on at the moment. Uh, yesterday and today, Boris Johnson is there, of course. Uh, and uh, he said, I'm here at NATO to talk about some of the threats and challenges that this organisation faces. And I think what people realise is that NATO is more important now than ever before. We need to be very vigilant on our eastern frontier, but also NATO is there to protect stability further afield. Uh, and we're talking today, that was yesterday, about the work that NATO is doing in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and in trying to make sure that the entire perimeter of Europe is safe. Now, Alex, it's really interesting that Boris Johnson is talking about uh, the eastern frontier um, because uh, I am um, hearing um, from people that I know in Poland and other parts of uh, the sort of eastern frontier, as he describes it, um, that uh, um, there is a groundswell of opinion building, um, which is absolutely anti-NATO. They're starting to ask some serious questions about what the heck NATO is doing in these countries, uh, and they actually want NATO gone. Uh, and uh, perhaps this is uh, sort of an indication of the same type of uh, uh, movement in people's thinking that we've seen with Brexit, with Trump, with the Italian referendum, and all the other things that... that uh, the establishment is worried about at the moment. Um, have you been hearing the same things? I've been picking up some of it, Mike. Uh, all three Baltic republics and northeastern Poland are on a, a plane, which is easy for the Russians to roll into, uh, although it's marshy and swampy in places. And so they are the ones who are going to be uh, obliterated um, You know, within 24 hours, many people say, no matter how many NATO forces are stationed in the country, if uh, it comes to hot warfare, and particularly those in Poland around the Suwalki area who've seen the US troops come and be stationed, and they've been tweeting out um, you know, very gung-ho images of themselves firing rockets towards the Russians as a training exercise. I think that's deeply shocked the Poles, actually. Um, and we see something here in this awful new newspaper, um, the New European, which has been posted to me. Here is um, you know, the, um, it's really the Labour Party's propaganda for continued uh, British membership of the European project, and you can see that May and um, uh, Johnson are there floating in the Atlantic, and okay. Trump and Putin, in this world view of the of the um, defeated British elite, they've both turned their backs on Europe. And you can see Holland and Merkel over there, uh, over here, um, you know, with the, standing somewhat towards Putin, obviously being on the continent. Uh, and in the world view uh, that this represents, there is nothing in Eastern Europe. 
It shows how little the British and American elites think about Eastern Europe, because actually between um, Germany and the Russian border are several Eastern European nations which are going to get trampled. What's the old saying? When the elephants fight, all that gets uh, injured are the mice. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Well, um, let's uh, just move on, because uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg speaking today, because they had the, the meeting of the uh, Ukrainian committee. Sorry, they, they, I've forgotten the name of it off the top of my head. But anyway, uh, they, Stoltenberg was talking to reporters after this meeting, talking about uh, a massive increase in ceasefire violations in the Ukraine. Uh, and he said the international community must keep pressuring Russia and respect obligations uh, to respect its obligations, sorry, especially while the security situation in eastern Ukraine remains so serious. Uh, and uh, he's calling for further sanctions and so on. It's important for inter international sanctions, uh, sorry, economic sanctions to be maintained, he said. Um, and uh, NATO wants to try to hold a, a meeting of the NATO-Russia Council before Christmas, uh, but they're complaining that Russia is reluctant to discuss Ukraine, uh, and uh, whereas they're saying that uh, Ukraine must be on the table. Uh, so, Alex, just uh, in 30 seconds, um, as, as Brian said a minute ago, uh, Ukraine clearly uh, back on the table as far as NATO is concerned. They, they, I get the feeling they appreciate that Syria is lost. Uh, as a as a sort of uh, proxy against Russia, and they're wanting to open up a new front. Yes, UK column members can uh, go to member forums and uh, watch our first of the new style editions of Insight, where we talk about this. Um, Ukraine is uh, even more of a, a risk to us than Syria. Uh, we've a lot of us have been ignoring for a while that uh, you know awful hor horrors have been perpetrated in Syria because we think of it as not Europe; it's the Middle East. Ukraine is right on our doorstep, and as I just mentioned, the geography of the whole of Eastern Europe and Northern Europe is such that people can move across without many obstacles. So, um, if we do destabilize Ukraine further, or, or the mad people in control in our countries, we're going to know about it jolly soon. Yes. Okay. And. Uh... HMS Illustrious Brian, uh, our aircraft carrier, it doesn't look in that bad, Nick. We it sold isn't. It, we sold it for £2 million to the Turks uh, for them to break it up. Um, they got it for a song, really, and uh, but it seems to be sailing under its own power into warm waters, which is something that the modern destroyers aren't able to do. Uh, no, I, I believe a billion pounds is going to be spent on trying to get the uh, Type 45s. With an, uh, uh, we need to confirm that. Oh, right. OK. Yeah. Well, we, we're hearing that the Type 45s need a billion. But here's the reality of David Cameron's so-called defence policy, which is to decimate Britain's military in order to help force through the European military system. So a perfectly good aircraft carrier worth millions and especially to the British public, that is simply sent away to be scrapped. Meanwhile, there's a childish threat that an aircraft carrier, Queen Elizabeth, that is not fully in service, does not have aircraft, will at some time in the future be sent into the South China Seas to intimidate the Chinese. But they're the same Chinese that David Cameron's invited in to rebuild our nuclear infrastructure. This, as we've said before, is straight out of Alice through the looking grass. We've got utter madness now in Westminster. Very, very dangerous people. But what is it always ending in war? And with the war comes the victims. So remarkable that the day um, that the aircraft carrier is scrapped, uh, the government has finally decided that it may well um, release or at least put um, Sergeant Blackman, Al Blackman, who's been in prison for the last uh, couple of years, uh, they may actually uh, release him on bail. So I've got to say that, um, what is this man? He's been a political scapegoat. He was put in a dangerous um, uh, war scenario, uh, horrible things happening around. He does something quite, quite horrible himself, um, but he's under tremendous pressure, but the government then uses him as a scapegoat. We have said he's been held as a political prisoner. I think that is exactly right. And he's been, I, I believe, used as a sort of safety valve to control the feeling of um, military veterans who are starting to see through what the government's up to. Alex, I don't know whether you'd just like a very quick uh, response on that one. There's something very, very uh, sinister going on in the way that uh, the military are being used for these wars. 
I think particularly the Royal Marines, uh, Brian, you've you've mentioned before how, um, well, just yesterday, in fact, with David Ellis on the show, how the Major General uh, in charge of the Marines, McGowan, is particularly nobbled. And I think it's that was a key appointment for them to get because the Marines are the most respected uh, fighting force other than our special forces, which are smaller. Uh, of any size, the Marines are our most respected fighting force and they, they rank with the best in the world. So obviously they're a, a huge danger to the government, which is uh, why returning servicemen in 1920 were disarmed and why we had the first breach of our um, Bill of Rights entitlements to bear arms after the First World War. Governments always look to keep the soldiers sweet, and if they can't, they want to keep them locked up. Yeah. Okay, Alex, I'm afraid we're, we're rapidly running out of time, so we're just going to cover uh, a couple more things that you'd included here. And I wanted to, to mention this one because you're obviously in the Netherlands, and uh, the Netherlands, one of the first... <laughs> Uh, countries to be pushing forward with the uh, euthanasia agenda. So you wanted to highlight this, uh, which seems like a pretty terrible story to me. The headline is, my brother is dead. Uh, and we've got a quote here from it. Uh, and the quote says, uh, of course, he was sad about being euthanized. Uh, euth uh, he had been sad the previous day when he saw his two little sons for the last time. He hadn't cried for the last month, but he did when his boys came to say goodbye. They, they knew that Papa was ill and that he couldn't get better again, but they didn't know that he wouldn't be there the next day. Mark did know that, though, which is why he cried. Uh, hey, fever, he blurted out through his tears when they looked questioningly at him. No, they ha no, you haven't, said the youngest, crawling back into his lap one more time. Um, I, the, the brother of the euthanized uh, person, uh, had to think of my daughter uh, and what I feel, I, uh, sorry, and what I would feel if I knew I was holding her for the last time. Um, what is going on here, Alex? What's going on is this man was, uh, it affects many, um, an alcoholic. And his parents tried to bail him out. His brothers and sisters did their best. And he became depressed and desperate, as many do. It affects almost every family somewhere. Uh, but what happened? He, he talked it into himself that the thing to do was to euthanize himself. Uh, great, said the doctor. If you're sure you want to go ahead with it, I'll, I'll gladly take you off the state's books. So um, that was it. He, he arranged a date. This is always the oddest thing about being in the Netherlands, uh, is that you talk to people and they say, uh, sorry, I can't see you next Saturday. Granny's being uh, injected. You know, it's, it's planned. Uh, and they go, uh, you know, a last drink together. And that's it. Uh, the state's happy. The doctors are quite happy to do this. We covered this on the 24th of February, if you look up the UK column archive, uh, with an old lady whose husband asserted that she wanted to die and she just mumbled and then she got injected. So a lot of this, a lot of this is going on. And increasingly, the Dutch government wants to broaden the definition of euthanasia candidates to anyone who considers their life complete. So young adults with mental health problems. So uh, in this country, uh, when this situation or this issue comes up for debate, something the parliamentarians that are supportive of the idea constantly say is, oh no, this is not the start of a slippery slope. But the Netherlands is absolutely demonstrating that it is because the warnings from us and, and people that are against this in principle uh, are, are basically that, that, well, it won't end with people that are terminally ill. It will end up with, and you're now talking about somebody who has got nothing more wrong with them than alcoholism, which may well be dealt with in other ways. Yes, and what's worrying is <clears throat> this isn't being done quietly now. Uh, it's as with the abortion agenda, it's being trumpeted. You know that there was a Twitter hashtag, shout your abortion this year. And this seems to be shout your euthanasia because uh, the chap whose brother uh, euthanized it or was leaned upon to euthanize himself in this case has written in this uh, general interest magazine, Linda, which is where I got the quotation from. And at the bottom of the article, it says, this is an abridged extract from a forthcoming book on how my brother topped himself. Wow. So... So we're going to be, it's being heavily propagandized then? Absolutely it is, yes. Yeah. Okay, well, um, we'll just end uh, on a bit of uh, corruption. I'm oh, sorry about that. So uh, this is from Fair Press. Uh, the story is uh, Fair Press exclusively brings the study representations of corruption in the British, French and Italian press. Look, we don't have time to read the quote. Alex, just, just give us the background to this. Oh, the background is that uh, studies have been done comparatively on how uh, the press in these three European countries report corruption. And the, the takeaway finding was that whereas the Italians focus on judges and whether they do their job or not, the French and especially the British uh, simply uh, use other words that don't that are not redolent of corruption. Uh, they, if they use corruption vocabulary, it's for overseas uh, events. And if there's corruption at home, they use other terms instead. Right. OK. And uh, we'll just end on this one then, which is. A book by David White called How Corrupt is Britain? And the, the 
The blurb says, uh, banks accused of rate fixing, members of parliament cooking the books, major defence contractors investigated over suspect arms deals, police accused of being paid off by tabloids. The headlines are unrelenting these days. Perhaps it's high time we ask just how exactly how corrupt is Britain? This is a symposium held in Liverpool three and a half years ago, uh, written up into a book. And all the contributors had the points, exactly the same points as that last article, which is that the British are, well, maybe they're waking up a bit now, but they've been uh, tempted to start historically to say, we don't do corruption because backhanders do not physically change hands. Well, even, even then, sometimes they do. Uh, the point he's making, or David White as editor is making throughout the book, is, is just that, that when we have really spectacular, mind-boggling corruption, the press just ignore it. And the, uh, the most egregious example he cites is when Alistair Darla, with Darling was Chancellor during the 2008 crisis. Uh, he just got some selected hand-picked bankers uh, around a takeaway and said, right chaps, uh, am I going to oblige the British taxpayer for the next two generations to shore you up? And they said, yes, that would be a jolly good idea. And the press, as David White says in this book, did not think that that was worth reporting as corruption. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, Alex, thank you very much for joining us. There we have it. Um, Pretty heavy um, UK column news today, and I think it's made an impact on quite a few of our viewers. I can see uh, from their comments in the chat box, we are moving into extremely dangerous times in UK. Uh, can we do something about it? Yes, we can. It simply requires enough people to say no and uh, to start challenging what's happening everywhere possible. Can we do something to help Melanie Shaw? I believe we can. We've got a target now. Am I allowed to use that word? I just have, uh, which is uh, clearly the uh, Justice uh, Committee. The Justice Committee says it wants to understand what's going wrong with justice. I think we need a few tens of thousands of people um, to tell Mr. Bob Neal and his team that really he is the problem. Uh, because if he's not taking the evidence as to what's happening, he must be the problem personally. But I leave it up to you to decide how that should be done. And the only thing I would add is, um, you know, Melanie said in her telephone call, um, if you'd like to send her a, a Christmas yeah. card, I think at this point, Melanie needs a lot of Christmas cards, not just for her own uh, well-being and sort of sense that people are looking out for, but to send a message to the establishment that we are watching what they're doing. Yeah, good point, Mike. Well, that's it for today. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.